Hello, everyone. I think it's uh, time for us to start. It's 202 in Geneva, and we have quite a number of people joining us uh, today. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, thanks to Agustina for uh, supporting us with the uh, hosting of, of, of this event. And greetings to all of you from uh, the International Road Federation here in uh, Geneva, uh, Switzerland. My name is Susanna Zamataro. I'm Director General at the uh, IRF. And I'm extremely pleased to welcome uh, all of you to this, um, to this webinar this afternoon, at least afternoon in Geneva, um, a digital twin for roads, a combined physics and data-driven approach to predict roads deterioration. We are, as IRF, very pleased to uh, host you for this uh, webinar in collaboration with the University of Birmingham, the University of Nottingham, and the University of Manchester, and thanks to the uh, support from uh, UK, UK Crick U21 and National uh, Highways. Plenty of exciting content to be shared and knowledge to be shared this afternoon with uh, you, so I'm going to keep this very, very short. And I just want to remind you a couple of housekeeping, um, housekeeping rules. And I'm extremely pleased to see that we have people joining us literally from all over the continent. Um, housekeeping rules, um, I'll be handing over the floor um, in, in few seconds to uh, our moderator for, for uh, today. Meran Eskandari is a lecturer, at the, um, uh, lecturer on infrastructure asset management at the University of uh, Birmingham. Before I do so, as you can see, and many of you are already using, the chat has been enabled. You can use the chat to exchange information um, um, and comment and, and, and greet us as well. Uh, but please, if you want to put uh, forward questions to the speakers, make sure you use the question answer function that you should be able to see at the bottom of um, on, your, on your Zoom uh, bar um, on, on the right. Uh, we will make sure that uh, we uh, stick within time. Uh, there's been time that has been allocated for question and answers. We'll take those question and answers at the end of the, um, of the presentations we have lined up for today. Uh, make sure that your questions is, is short to the point so as to allow us to take as many questions as possible in the time that we have um, available. Now, before passing the, the floor uh, to Meran, um, allow me as well to uh, inform you, yes, within the housekeeping rules, um, this webinar is being recorded. We will make sure to share with you both the recording and all the presentations uh, that you will uh, see um, today. So rest reassured and focused on the discussion today. We'll take care of providing you recordings and presentations, they will be available on our website and you will be notified directly when they are available. Um, let me share one final piece of information uh, with you uh, on this uh, extremely important uh, topic. The digital twins will be also part of a workshop that we will be hosting uh, during Intertraffic Amsterdam on the 31st of March. Uh, um, IRF will be hosting on 31st of March in the premises of Intertraffic Amsterdam a dedicated um, workshop on um, novel practices for, uh, uh, for uh, asset management and of course digital twins will be uh, part of that. All the information will be soon available on our website 31st of March at 2 o'clock we'll be sharing this information in, in the chat. Without further ado, uh, let me pass the floor now uh, to Meran Eskandari. Yes, Meran, I see you on, on the screen. And um, Meran will be leading the conversation um, today. Meran, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I can see um, people from around the world. Um, very welcome to our seminar on Digital Twin for Roads. Uh, my name is Meron Skanderi. I'm a lecturer in infrastructure asset management at the University of Birmingham. I can change my slide. Um, yes, so this is the program for today. Um, after a brief introduction from myself, 
uh, on the project and its components. Um, I will um, hand it over to my colleague, Mr. Kun Chen, to talk about the systematic review that we did uh, on uh, to identify the most suitable machine learning approach for um, road um, digital twin. And um, then after that, we got our colleagues from uh, Manchester. Um, Ms. Mengia will talk about um, the performance improvement that they did, um, and their background is computer science on and the selected machine algorithm, machine learning algorithm selected um, by our systematic digital review system. And there at the end, uh, the last but not uh, least at all, my colleague um, Alvaro Garcia Hernandez from University of Nottingham um, will talk about our vision and uh, um, how we are taking this ongoing um, research forward. So, um, as I just mentioned, this is an ongoing research. Um, we thought um, the right time to engage with you um, and to hear your voices and to tell you what we have done is that as early as possible. Um, so we are just reporting part of our fundings, and uh, this is uh, mainly on the systematic literature review process and also the ongoing um, research. So um, as um, Susanna kindly mentioned, these universities of Birmingham, Nottingham and Manchester, Birmingham and Nottingham background uh, is civil engineering, pavement management, uh, pavement material, while Manchester team um, is a science, um, um, computer science um, team. And they have been helping us on the machine learning in particular. The project um, has been supported by the UK National Highways. And a part of it um, has been funded by UCRIC, which is um, a government, UK government um, funding um, sort of mechanism. And uh, the, the rest of the project, the main part of the project, has been funded by, through U21 agreement by the universities of Birmingham and Nottingham. Our aim is to develop a digital twin for roads, very short sort of thing that we, we are passionate about and we want to do. But, um, but the first question coming to your mind um, might be that why digital twin? Why we need a digital twin for roads? Well, I'm not going to spend too much of time and sorry, it's, it might be a bit of rushing through different things. We have a lot to report to you and therefore we're just trying to keep it as short as possible. But the main reason is to speak, we want to move away from um, a reactive approach that we have now to a more uh, predictive approach and through that to achieve a proactive asset management. So doing that, we believe we can save costs, we can uh, prepare ourselves for climate change, for example, just one example. And then um, again, my main sort of thing is uh, to save lives if we can. So this is the, our vision or the concept that we have or the, the definition that we came up with for road, a digital twin for roads. And I have to mention that there are um, various sort of um, definitions and interpretation of digital twin. And therefore I thought it's useful to see this. And so we are um, on the same page when we talk about um, a road digital twin. Um, so uh, just briefly describing this definition for you, um, it is a 3D visualization in our mind um, as a definition. So we, we have a digital replica or, or a physics, a physical assets, which is a road section. Um, this is based on a prediction of a future condition uh, of the asset while showing this current situation, current condition. For that, um, we are relying on real-time data and historical data. And it's, these two terms can be quite um, relative. Well, but what, you, what we mean by real time, it might be, I don't know, matter of hours delayed data or seconds delayed data. Um, or an historical one might be a six months uh, old uh, sort of data. But anyway, we fit that into our model um, to show its current, the current situation, the current condition of the asset. Uh, while we use that data, um, to predict the future condition. And that is our data-driven model that you can see at the center of the uh, slide. So we use machine learning for that data-driven model to predict the condition of asset in the future. Um, while we, what we are doing is using physics-based models um, to give, give us an extra set of data when we have a lack of data or we don't have sufficient data. 
um, from our sensors um, and the list of um, condition assessment techniques that you can see on the left hand side of your screen. We believe um, broad uh, as an asset is not an isolated asset and uh, there, is, um, there are impacts from other assets um, around it, um, such as um, ground, uh, and we see that as an asset, um, and also buried utilities like drainage system and so on, and we try to bring those elements into our physics-based uh, model, and we have a bit of uh, um, further information on that. But how we use this sort of information, our digital twin, let's say, so our vision is to use it from design to operation and maintenance. So throughout the life cycle of, of the asset, of the road, to inform our decision making. So if you are at design uh, stage, how to uh, consider the future um, sort of condition of the asset in our design. Let's say climate change, for example. If you are during the operation and maintenance, how we can incorporate um, future as a condition in, I don't know, uh, 10 years time in our maintenance strategy and come up with optimized maintenance strategy. Again, sorry, this is brief, but I don't want uh, to take too much of the time. So the first part that we started was that uh, we did a systematic literature review. The aim was to identify the most suitable machine learning approach for a data-driven um, part of the work. The project was funded by UCRIC. And during that process, we used machine learning to, um, and it was, we used a software that uh, my colleague Kuhn will, will tell you about. We, we reviewed around 70,000 articles, um, so less than that, but that's what the amount of articles that we went through to just identify the best uh, suitable, most appropriate uh, sort of machine learning. Um, so a, a bit on just ongoing research. So you saw that the slide data-driven model Kuhn will tell you and Alvaro Bost will tell you about um, our result, but this is like just to show you what we have done. So using historical data to predict um, condition of asset in future. We use numerical modeling um, and that was on rotting. So the data driven model was on predicting rotting for roads. Um, numerical modeling, um, trying to get an extra set of uh, data to inform our um, data driven model and visualization um, hasn't been the focus um, or, or a research so far, which is because we thought that's something that can be done by the industry and that's not that much of the challenge, but we, we know that there are some challenges um, and uh, it is part that we, we have an eye on. Um, so that is the overall sort of ongoing research, and we are going to go through each of these elements, apart from visualization, um, uh, briefly telling you what we have done. So with no further ado, I would like to pass it to my colleague Kuhn to tell you about the um, systematic literature review. Kuhn, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Marianne, for setting up the concepts. Um, I'm going to share my screen also. Uh, can you let me share my screen? Thank you. Sorry, it doesn't want to. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marian. Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm Quinn, the PhD student from University of Birmingham and Nottingham. Um, so yeah, I'm going to present you the systematic literature review that we, we did um, on this topic, digital twin for roads, um, more from a data-driven machine learning perspective. So, so as you can see here, um, in order to conduct the systematic literature review, uh, a few steps are taken uh, and considered. So the step one is to identify the requirements of a road digital twin. Um, there are various definitions as Marianne has mentioned. So we want to identify the requirements of digital twin as well as uh, like a, a road digital twin. And second step is to do the uh, systematic literature review concretely to identify the most suitable machine learning algorithms to address the uh, requirements that we gathered from the previous step. And then step three 
is to uh, train and test the selected machine learning algorithms uh, on our own data. And uh, we want to check the performance, especially on condition prediction. And then the fourth step, the last step is to actually uh, look into the algorithms and try to modify them, understand them and modify them. And then the goal is to try to improve the prediction accuracy. So um, the focus of my work um, is only on step one and step two. So I will just quickly talk you through my slides. I think more interesting and exciting part is step three and step four, where we actually look at the machine learning algorithms and then improve them. Um, but my colleagues uh, from Manchester, Minja, will cover step three and step four. So I will talk you through the step one and step two. So basically on digital twin, it's very hot topic. Um, everybody's talking about it, but if you don't know much about it, so this is a general kind of digital twin definition, as well as you can call it requirements. So basically it's a data flow between physical asset and, and, and digital asset. Um, and as you can see, I highlight some words here. I just talk you briefly through it. I won't spend much time on this slide. Um, so this between, regardless of any industry applications, it depends on data. So you need to have data connection. You need to have good quality of data and the variety of data. And uh, if possible, it covers across different stages of the life cycle of, of the road, for example. And if possible, real-time data, taking advantage of industry 4.0, big data analytics, machine learning, definitely is one of them, to actually make sense of the data, to reason about the data, and then to help us to um, make decisions, for example. And then based on literature as well, that user tree should have the um, requirements that it should um, include a, a multi-scale simulation. Um, in, as a, uh, of the as build system and also taking predict probability into consideration. So this is just from some literature a review um, results. We have put the between requirements generally. And if you look at the table on the right hand side, this is more specific tailored for roads, um, but it's uh, also similar to the general digital twin requirements. So it's, you can say it's, it has to be a digital replica of the physical road. Um, including geometry, structure, material, landscape, et cetera. And also the data should cover a, a diverse range of types and different sources, depending on what you want the digital twin to do. And the data you have also needs to be real time, if possible, uh, for uh, considering road inspection, or, or et cetera, different activities you can monitor your roads. And then your data also sh should be um, spanning across the whole life cycle of your physical road projects. If possible, then you can um, basically build a digital twin for different stages. And then more considering the functionalities concretely in terms of roads, um, you should have machine learning capability or simulation capability within your digital twin a road is the train to be able to understand the physical behavior of your road by doing some knowledge extraction or build machine learning prediction models or mixed with physical based models. It's similar to an existing um, asset called payment management system, but it's more modern version using digital twin tool to build a payment management system to understand your asset, your roads better, as well as predict your, your um, performance, future performance better. And also including the um, maintenance planning aspects by using deep and reinforcement learning, which is very, very um, useful. An uh, algorithm uh, which takes uh, um, like a different interest of uh, various stakeholders into consideration to do the maintenance planning. So this is a general requirements of digital twin and the road digital twin. Uh, so Maria mentioned this slide. Uh, I just show you again. Basically, my focus will be uh, this review focus is on data driven approach and uh, historical data, as Maria already mentioned. So just moving on to step two, um, this is the actual systematic literature review. We use the FU reviewer software developed by UCL and uh, it has a machine learning feature enabled, which basically helped us to speed up the process, um, which I will explain uh, very shortly in one slide afterwards. And, and, um, and the next slide is, yeah, so this is the slide that is the core slide for the review. Um, 
as you can see, this is a whole process from the beginning to the end, how we um, identify the articles and how we screen them. So I will not spend too much time, but I will just quickly talk you through this. As you can see from the top, you have to define the keywords. So we have the keywords in the table um, about the role, digital train, machine learning, and et cetera, payment performance. This is the functionality that we focus on as part of this review uh, to see the condition prediction. Then we, this is a search engine. We used about 10 engines to look for the articles. And after collating all the references, um, we have found almost 70,000 articles in total. So then we started to do a very brief um, uh, trial screening. Um, basically, me and uh, Minjie, also Maran, also helped in the whole process to uh, to um, uh, like screen the articles. And uh, we use the software, IP Reveal, to remove the duplicates. And after that, it's 50,000. And then we use the machine learning feature within the priority screening process. So this helps us to speed up the process by screening the title and abstract. So how it works is basically we uh, we, uh, we only had to screen 20% of the articles manually. And based on our screening results, the, 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 the software has learned uh, how to classify um, the screening result for the rest of all the articles, the 80%. So after this, we have about um, 1,700 articles um, after this priority screening, which took about two months for us to do. And after this, uh, we tried to obtain PDFs to actually read into the full, full paper um, to understand more uh, in terms of methodology and results. Um, so some of them, we couldn't get the PDF due to access a limitation. So after document retrieval, we have 1,500 articles. And then followed by this, uh, we have done a final screening where we actually uh, took a deeper look at the, the paper, um, including the methodology results. Um, basically three things, looking at the algorithm, the structure of the algorithm and equation, if they have presented clearly. And second thing is if they have a clear visualization of the machine learning training process and our validation process, the concrete graphs. And also we also, check if the performance of the algorithm is, is acceptable um, to say it at, at the first glance. So after this, we have 57 articles and then we group them because some articles belong to the same study. So afterwards we have 47 studies. And then after this, we put them into a weight of evidence stage. Um, this is also why we want to do the systematic literature review just to take many people's opinions on board and and make sure also we are inclusive, um, not miss out any important uh, key element. Also here we can adopt um, expert judgment and opinions in the way of evidence uh, stage. So here we invited civil engineers from Birmingham, from Nottingham, also from National Highways to look at this, to, to have interviews, to, ha to have some communication on these studies and also uh, in invited data scientists as well as machine learning group from Manchester um, to look at these uh, studies and then to rate them based on a weight of evidence metrics to see how suitable these machine learning algorithms are for a road digital twin context. And eventually there are three studies uh, selected to, to be invested further by the machine learning group from Manchester. And I will also briefly describe the weight of evidence stage in terms of the metrics, how we check it in a little bit more detail in the, in the next two slides. So this is the slide that shows a priority screening. Um, I won't spend much time. This is just shows how the software help us to, to speed up, um, to accelerate in our priority screening process, to classify the articles automatically. And this is a very um, simple kind of summary of the weight of evidence uh, because the weight of evidence metric itself is very, very long. Uh, it's quite detailed. And uh, we have submitted a paper which is on the review especially on this systematic literature review work. And uh, there it has the full version of the weight of evidence. But in summary, in essence, we look at um, three categories of um, the weight of evidence metrics, and then we rate articles uh, to say if they're high on this category, if they're medium, or if uh, they're low in terms of research soundness, appro appropriateness of study design, or relevance of study focus, for example. 
So for research soundness, it, it, just to look at the research as itself to, to see how well it's performed, um, looking at the R square as a performance metrics, but also to include, to check, to look at the data basically, because machine learning and digital tree are very important, importantly dependent on data. So we will look at the data, whether they are homogeneous, whether they have good quality, whether they have done data cleaning, et cetera. Um, so take a deeper look at that. And then second um, uh, categ uh, category, the uh, appropriateness of study design is really looking at the data variety in, in simple words. How diverse is their data? How different types, what types of data do they use? How many types? How many? So the diversity of the data. And then the, the last column is relevance of study focus. It's just to look at the volume of the data. How long is their road? How long, how many years historically they have counted for their data for how many years in terms of data volume. So these are all have been considered in machine learning and digital trees. So these things, that's why we put this as an important thing to consider as part of the weight of evidence stage. Um, so that, that, that's, I think that's it. Um, the next step is so um, basically in the end, we select uh, the studies that can be rated as high for all categories. Um, then those studies will be picked. So in the end, we picked three studies uh, to uh, basically look further and investigate further uh, using our own collected data. So here, I just briefly uh, also show you that in the systematic literature review, we also aim to discuss and identify the relationship and mappings between digital twin requirements that we have gathered that we have known so far with the machine learning capabilities. So this is ongoing research. We are writing a paper on it as a group exactly now. And uh, basically the table shows you how machine learning algorithm capabilities can actually fulfill and enable these two twin requirements. There are different requirements of these twin bars. So we are still looking to uh, like uh, investigate further to understand how they can actually satisfy and fulfill these requirements. And then before I pass on to, um, to Minjie to talk about machine learning algorithms, I just show you the, the data we use, the existing database um, um, as part of the project. So we use this well-known US public database, long-term payment performance, LTPP, um, because it, it's open access and also it provides all kinds of data with different categories, a wide variety of data and um, this is the data that we have collected um, from 100 row sections across 20 states in the US for 13 years historical data. And then you can see the, um, because it's geographically um, very distributed, that's why also the different types of pavement are considered. And then the, that's why the variety of data is very high. It covers a broad spectrum. Um, so this is our data, just really show you also, we have cleaned the data as well. Um, we believe it's a good approach because we know road condition data suffers data quality issues and it has measurement errors and also uh, equipment errors, for example. So we try to go through the data processing, but also we not only use the common method like outlier detection, um, uh, moving average, et cetera. We also need to consider domain expertise to understand if the data makes sense, et cetera. So we try to incorporate this. Um, we have a written a Python script to basically automatically clean our data. After this, you will have uh, more quality uh, data with high quality. And then after this, we can try to transform your data, normalize the data, depending on the, depending on the machine learning algorithm really uh, is, is optional. And then you will have a more refined data set and afterwards we will apply the machine learning. So, yeah, so data cleaning is very important, I think. And then here, just the, my last two slides, just to show you the data we used um, before we train and test um, uh, the algorithms on. So this is our data. Uh, we have 15 input parameters, out, one output parameter, that uh, 15 inputs that covers uh, six categories. And then this is how it looks like um, in, in, in data science tool. Uh, we're using Jupyter Notebook, a Pandas library, these common data science uh, tools to, to do the research. And then basically uh, we, we share this data with Manchester group, and then they will use this data and try and test the, the algorithm from the three st uh, selected studies. 
and then to see their performance on our own data and then to see if they can improve it um, and by optimizing the algorithm. So yeah, so thank you. So this is my part of the review. Um, I think now I will pass over to Minjia who will talk you through more on the machine learning parts of the review. Ninja, thank you very much, Kun. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kun. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, thank you, Kun. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mingjie. I'm a PhD, PhD student from the University of Manchester. So uh, as previously, uh, Kun has uh, stated, and uh, three machine learning algorithms uh, were used in those three studies uh, that identified according to the system uh, literature review results. So we would like to uh, apply these uh, machine learning algorithms on the uh, on our collected data to check the performance on condition uh, prediction. So also the further step step four, the algorithm now modified to improve the accuracy. So the selected algorithms from the three studies are support victim machine, the artificial neural network, and a recurrent neural network. So um, basically we use the R square and root, root mean square error as performance matrices to check uh, whether the machine learning algorithm gives a, a good prediction results or not. So basically we use 70% of total data set for training and the rest 30% for, for the validation. So let's first move on to the uh, support victim machine. Um, and this figure demonstrates how the SVM works. So if we given us to, uh, given samples have two features, we would like to divide the samples using a line or a hyperplane exercise. There are two, uh, more than two features. The idea of SVM is to find the optimal uh, hyperplane uh, that has the largest distance R to the support vectors. So since the distance R is related to parameters of the hyperplane, then the problem becomes a class uh, becomes a classic optimization problem. So this is the uh, uh, basic understanding of the SVM, but in many real practices, the data are not always linear separable. Uh, so one a typical example is demonstrated in this in, in this figure. Um, um, so in these cases, we actually can't find a hyperplane to divide these samples. So the solution is mapping the features to another feature space using some kernel functions. So we also call it a kernel trick. So when processing, when processing the uh, SVM, SVM algorithm, the product, the dot products, the phi x i and phi x j needs to be uh, calculated. So the kernel function is a function that gives an equivalent results to the pro, uh, dot product of uh, phi x i and phi x j. Uh, instead of calculating the phi x i and phi x j, which is time consuming and sometimes uh, impossible. So the kernel function directly uh, calculates the dot products of map mapping functions. So the kernel function allows the inputs to be linear separable in higher dimensions and is more efficient at the same time. So for, uh, for more uh, detailed information, you can uh, further uh, refer to this paper. Um, basically, uh, we have selected uh, two different kernels, which is Pearson Universal Kernel from the original paper that we selected. And another one is the second order polynomial kernel to make some improvements on the prediction performance. So here is the training and uh, validation results uh, using the, uh, the Pearson Universal Kernel. The results are obtained by uh, apply, applying settings from original study on collected. The data set. So the result shows the Pearson universal may not be, uh, Pearson universal kernel may not be uh, suitable for this data set. Um, so we changed the kernel to make some uh, improvements. So here is the training and validation results using the polynomial kernel. So the results are trained and validated on the same uh, collected data set. Um, but clearly the performance matrices R2 and, and IMSE are all better than the uh, previous kernel. So according to these results, the polynomial kernel is better than Pearson universal kernel in, uh, in, in this 
data set. So since we uh, have done the test on the SVM, uh, let's move on to the next uh, algorithm, the artificial neural network. Uh, given a sample uh, consists of a set of input features x1, x2 to uh, xm, and a set of outputs y1 to uh, yn, the aim of ANN is to find the pattern between the inputs and outputs use nonlinear fitting. So generally, an uh, ANN is an, uh, has an input layer and an output layer, and the hidden layers are between the input layer and the output layer. So in the hidden layer, the, the values of inputs are multiplied by the weights and pass through a linear linear active activation function to produce the outputs. So in this project, we use the single layer with three neurons ANN from a selected paper. So the number of inputs is 15 and the number of outputs is one. So the ANN used the forward propagation to calculate the predicted results. So also the, also the back propagation is used to update the weight weight uh, denoted as W of each layer to according to the uh, prediction results to give uh, uh, to, 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 to adjust the weight and uh, using the gradient descent method. So here is the training and validation results um, using the LM algorithm, training algorithm from the selected paper. Um, and actually, uh, also, we can uh, improve these results using another uh, uh, populistic-based uh, training algorithm called the Bayesian regularization. So here is the training and value uh, training and validation results using using this algorithm. Um, the, the the results are uh, trained and validated on the on the, on the same uh, collected data set. So the performance matrices R two and R M. SE are all better than previous uh, LM algorithm. So uh, finally, the, the, the recurrent neural network. So since the data were collected in a yearly basis, that, uh, so it is actually can be regarded as a time series or a time sequence. Also, the output of data set is in an incremental routine and the uh, input variables contains cumulative and incremental values. So indicating the out, uh, current output may, uh, may, may, may be related to the previous states. So, so we can uh, try just try to apply the recurrent neural, neural network on, on our data set. So, uh, so uh, different from the AN, the uh, RN just add a, a past state. Uh, the output RN is re also related to the past state. So, so it can uh, so the pre so the previous state can be uh, can be passed to uh, can be uh, make uh, influ influence on the current state. So here is the structure of the uh, recurrent neural ne neural network. So to train the neural network, we use a back propagation through through time. And here you can uh, here it's uh, the the here the, uh, the the past state is is. Uh, transferred to the next time step. Um, and here is the uh, training and validation results for the uh, RN, the results obtained also uh, by uh, applying settings from the uh, selected study on the collected data set. But, um, but as, as you can see, the, 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 the results is, um, is, 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 is not uh, quite uh, satis uh, is not quite uh, satisfied. Um, uh, there is two possible reasons for for this result. The first is it is uh, we we lack uh, it is a lack of data density. Um, for example, in the original paper, the data was collected on a weekly basis or a, or or a monthly basis, but uh, our data set is 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 collected on a on a yearly basis. So it may be uh, so the information may be uh, may, uh, we may lose lose some information about uh, about the uh, about the patterns also also uh, also the data set also lack of uh, enough data lens uh, as Kun has uh, previously stated uh, that, that uh, we we uh, there is only 13 samples or for each load section so so the data lens is not may, may not long enough so 
I need. Uh, I also uh, uh, would like to make some conclusions on the machine learning algorithms from the training results and validation results. Uh, the AN has gives the best uh, uh, best results according to the R squared and RMSC. Uh, and you can see also also at the support vector machine also have a great improvement if, if, if we select the different kernels to to uh, if we select different kernels then this is the overall uh, prediction results uh, using uh, of the three three uh, three machining algorithms from both uh, training validation and or, or overall prediction results, AN also or, AN all pr uh, produced uh, uh, the best uh, prediction results. Uh, I may also introduce some extended research of my uh, in my in, in our group. Uh, um, uh, uh, one of our one, one of my colleague also used the deep learning models to identify the uh, vehicles in uh, satellite images, but. Actually, we we uh, uh, we uh, which uh, we could uh, estimate the stationary vehicle distribution in complex urban uh, things. Uh, actually, uh, due to the powerful generalization capability of deep learning models, we believe uh, it is also feasible to uh, apply these technologies or techniques to uh, road condition monitoring. We also we could also use the deep learning models to identify roads in satellite images and. Evalu evaluate the uh, road conditions by the uh, de uh, by the de detection results. Okay, so that's all for my part, and I will uh, uh, I will handle I will pass to the uh, Avalo for for more detailed uh, road digital twin. Avalo. If you can uh, yeah. stop sharing, Menjie and Alvaro can can share. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I will share my screen. All right. So, yeah. Are you saying my? Can you see my? Yeah. So you are seeing my screen. So thank you yes, very much can. for. Thank you. Thank you very much for seeing me. So this is Alvaro Garcia. I work at the University of Nottingham. And well, I'm going to present the work that we have uh, been doing so far, right? So, so this is it. So the idea uh, that we have is, well, you saw the work that uh, Kun has done and you have seen the vision from Iran and the algorithms from Minjie. So what we really want is to increase the accuracy of uh, data-driven models. Let's say you have these artificial intelligence models and you are missing data and they may not be as accurate as, as, as you would want, right? So we want to create the most accurate predictions of road degradation that we want. And as uh, my colleague Kuhn mentioned, uh, we are focusing on routine and we are focusing on routine simply because it was the most available data that we could find with uh, the American database, with the LTTP, LTPP database. So we have selected uh, routine from 90 road sections in across across 20 US states, right? And you see you see them here. You see the the states where, where we took the data from, and the data that was available in the LTPP database where payment geometry, traffic, routine, temperature, uh, annual precipitation, age, and maintenance treatments. Okay. So as you have seen before, so the first approach that that we had was to well simply get the data, right? And use uh, a machine learning algorithm and random forest algorithm. This is what we use, and we tried to predict it. So we try to predict uh, year after year what will happen. And but as you can see, in some cases we succeeded and in some cases we didn't succeed at all. I mean, so, so you see here, so we were very far. So what, what you see here is uh, the, the prediction uh, of every year, right? So you see all the, all the data here and every year 
you, you, you have them here all mixed, right? So the, there are data from one year predictions or from five years predictions or from 10 years predictions and so on, right? They are all mixed. And you can see that, well, it seems this data seem to follow a, a linear trend, but not really, you know, so there is a big noise. And we thought that this will be happening, well, first, because we thought that there could be errors in the in the predictions or in the data that we took, and, and, and we will address that in the future. I mean, we need to uh, insert uncertainty in, in our models. But then we thought that uh, there was a lack of physical, you see, so these uh, random forest algorithm, algorithms, these, these machine learning algorithms didn't have any information of the interaction between different materials in the paint. So we thought, well, why don't we, since we have the geometry of the sections, so the geometry was part of the database, why don't we simply try to predict uh, the geometry, so the routing, using finite elements and see what happens. And this is what we did. So we use uh, a commercial software, Abacus. Uh, we took a paper that predicted routing from, from data so, and then we just follow it and try to predict the, the results. So try to predict the routing. And the results were pretty far from reality, I would say. So the results were terrible. The results from the finite elements of and, and why they were terrible. Well, simply because this is just a, a physics model, you know, so, so that well, we may have errors in the materials, so in the properties of the materials, so the exact properties of the materials were not specified in the database. But also there are many things happening in the pavements that cannot be captured by, by this type of models. So for example, I don't know, so, so there may be flooding, so you don't know, so, so maybe overloading, things that, Simply, we cannot know what's what happened. So moisture in the pavement. So then, uh, well, following similar research in other fields, we simply thought that what a good approach would be to take, since this hasn't didn't work, and this didn't work very well either. So we thought, well, why don't we combine both, both results? And what we did was to use the results from the finite element software and routine. We implemented them as inputs for the random forest algorithms. And by doing so, the noise of our results reduced very much. And we were amazed by that. Yeah. So you can see that the results that include the physics models as input really have a reduced model. So you see here an error square of 0 0.81. So we have 19% of the results that cannot be explained by the physics or by the data that we introduced. And so we may need you know, to, to, to add sensors to the road or acquire extra data. We have to see how to address that problem still, yeah? But the fact that we could increase the probability, increase, sorry, increase the accuracy of the predictions by adding these physics simulations, which were not even very good, you know? But the data, the output, improve the data very much. And here you have all the results compared. So now, uh, well, so we think that this is the way to go, definitely. So we think that we need to combine uh, this uh, physics, uh, physics uh, driven approach with uh, the data driven models. So we need to introduce physics formulas, you know, into the into the data, right? So physics results from physics into the into the numerical simulation into the data into the data into the data models that we have, and we need to find ways to increase the accuracy of our numerical models too. And this is what we are doing. And I think my five minutes are over, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very and, much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alvaro. Um, we have some very interesting questions. So I just try um, to address as many as I can. Um, now, starting with, um, um, uh, you can probably read some, I try to answer some of them. So I'm just going for the one that I haven't answered. And if you have interest, you can just read my answers probably there um, to just avoid repetition. But then, um, so one question um, uh, from the team, um, is on satellite images. Um, um, so resolution, not necessarily the free satellite images. 
they don't have enough resolution. But what you can see even from that three sort of um, satellite images is you can uh, see a, a trend in deterioration. Okay, so Mengia mentioned uh, identifying cars. So if you can see for probably patterns of uh, traffic, again, we can see potential defects. So that's another way of uh, identifying defects. So it wouldn't be necessarily saying, oh yes, there is a five millimeters crack um, on the road surface, but it can be an alert system to tell us, oh, there is something going on there, or we can see a trend in the surface and so on. But there are some high resolution satellite images which you have to, to pay. Um, Dr. Lung, um, Zhang is here with us from Manchester. I believe he wants to answer that for his PhD student. Please, over to you, Dr. Lung. Yeah, yeah. can I make some comments regarding Please the do. image? Yes. Yeah. Obviously, the, uh, the image based the highest his advantage and the limitations. But I also uh, mentioned is about the image resolution. One we currently use is uh, just a common Google satellite. We could identify PV. PV, you know, this uh, uh, is the PV on top of the roof. It's quite small size. We can identify no problem. And the cars in yeah, large size because car usually is three or four meters. But PV probably is. Uh, uh, one meter, less than one meter, wide is a uh, half meter, so it's no problem. But I understand the road condition. We have to say <clears throat> if has a significant problem or large scale problem, the, the satellites will be provided complementary solutions. Because sometimes if we want to monitor the whole road conditions, probably it's not possible, but in each solution give you a initial idea, at least some general uh, perspective of the road conditions in some large area, if not possible to using data, for example, data of sensing solution, normal sensing solutions. So the uh, image based method will provide alternative. Obviously, if we purchase higher resolution image, we could even find the smaller uh, problems, smaller scale problems. Yeah, I hope this helps. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there was another comment um, on sensors. I mean, two two of them um, uh, on sensors, and uh, so we we haven't uh, covered that part and the data collection. But um, definitely, that's something that we propose, um, and we are um, considering to test. So the current data collection might not be enough, and uh, might not give us the enough granularity. Um, but what we are trying to do is to add more data if it's required. But the other problem that might, you know, that might be the answer from industry is that how to handle that big data, that amount of data that you are to collect from um, different um, sources. Okay, so we ju just try to optimize that. Um, uh, something interesting, that's a question for uh, Kuhn on systematic literature review, but he's trying to answer. But briefly, um, someone asked uh, in the chat um, Q&A function that how we end up uh, in three uh, studies where, when we started with 70,000 articles. So I'm just asking, you know, if it, what was the efficiency of the process? So obviously using especially machine learning, it's not 100% efficiency, but what we tried to do was to make sure we have an inclusive system. That's why we selected to do systematic literature review. And then the final selection, it was quite labor intensive. It took three hours, four months to do it. We used machine learning, but that that wasn't doing the whole process. There was a training uh, uh, process and so on. Um, but then, um, yeah, it, it is quite a um, reliable system. So it, this is not the first time that I used this. And um, yeah, we were quite happy with the output, but obviously nothing is 100%. OK. Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if we have probably time for a um, couple of more questions. I'm just going through the Q&A. Colleagues, please do the same. If there is anything that you want to raise, please do. Um, so while I go through this as well. Yeah, there are, um, Dr. Long, some question on um, prediction models. So probably you can address that, including, um, just going through this now. 
Which yeah, question? Something, you, uh, yeah, just trying to find it now. Yeah, sorry. Do, do you mean the question regarding the prediction model presented yes. in yeah, yeah. In background to improve the prediction? Yeah. So currently, yeah, me you may also make some uh, additional comments. But the, the, the initial reason we use our own, so for example, we mainly use uh, uh, programmable, uh, like a MATLAB or Python software. The reason we use that is it pro provide the flexibility to allow us to construct the software. We, we, we didn't use uh, MPDG software. So, uh, I mean, so uh, in background, so to improve the prediction, but yeah, the, the, the purpose is still finding, you know, the relationship between the uh, input and output to see which could provide uh, more correlations. Also more, we, we would like to see which model has the most potential, but obviously there are always uh, some, some space we can improve it either further dealing with the results. For example, we already have some prediction results. We can further train it. So for example, even we could use some joint uh, solutions, uh, combinations, or we say uh, is uh, uh, ensemble solutions. For example, we already use three different solutions in RNN or the SVM. We may even some perform better, some perform worse, but it, for certain conditions, they may always some, some methods outperform others. So we make using the joint solutions from three of them. But, but because uh, the, the product, uh, the time duration is only a very short time, allow us to do the first facilities. In the future, we could scale up to the different models as well as different data. So uh, as mentioned as well, so the data are also important. Not only so we, we get the best performance on the current data, we need to understand the data better. In the future, we may extend it, uh, the data size. That's also a potential way to do it. Thank you very much. I mean, there are some um, comments and questions on using live data and more frequent source of data. Um, yes, definitely, that's something that we are doing at the moment. Uh, LiDAR was mentioned. We are using LiDAR um, images. It's another of our uh, PhD student. He just started, but he's using LiDAR data. Um, uh, HTM4 has been mentioned. I mean, HTM modeling, life cycle analysis. This can be incorporated, but the big difference is that uh, HTM4 is using historical data, and uh, it is it has a more um, physics-based model rather than data-driven models. So that's the big difference between those two. Um, it's only one minute left. Colleagues, do you want to add anything, or Alvaro, Dr. Long? No, I mean, simply that we are evolving this work. So there were some colleagues that uh, were commenting about mm, combining LiDAR with, with this type of result of, with these type of models, you know, for, for more accurate predictions. We are working on that. Now the question is how much accuracy do you really need, you know, in order to get a good prediction? So maybe you don't need that many data, you know, as, as, as we may think. Uh, so that, that's a big challenge. So do we need sensors inside? There was someone commenting on back calculation. Yeah, back calculation is great, but you need to have some uh, results from the road, from sensors. And at the minute, we don't have data from sensors. If we could have data from sensors embedded in the road, we could back calculate elasticity modulus. So that's, that's something to be done, but how many sensors you need, which is the frequency of these sensors, that's still something to be answered. Anyway, so this is a field to, that is expanding and it's, it's great that, that, that we are seeing how it grows. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have Susanna on the screen <laughs> to just tell us about time. Thank you very much, Susanna. I, I would like to thank you, thank um, IRF um, for hosting the event. Um, great effort. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, and I, I, thanks to you, Meran, and all the speakers. And I just would like to remind everyone there were plenty of questions. We will be sharing the presentations and the recording on the IRF website. We will be notified and mark the date of 31st of March, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Geneva time. We will be in physically in, in Amsterdam for a workshop on digital twins and more novel practices for uh, asset management. We will be sharing with you the information soon. It should be up uh, on, on our website by tomorrow. 
and we'll figure out how we can um, answer most of these questions that were left unanswered for, for today. Unfortunately, thank, you yeah, for the yeah, thank you very thanks much. Thanks to the moderator, Meran. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good day.